All right, welcome to the real business cycle model. Um, if you notice, we skipped a couple of chapters here. Um, that's because I didn't really want to get too far into the dynamic optimization stuff, especially with how little of the semester we have left. Um, so we're just skipping over the real business cycle model. Now, um, the chapter itself is fairly mathematical. I wouldn't worry too much about the math. In that, um, I would rely more on this particular lecture that's going to be a, a good um, treatment of the material, at least for what I think is important for this course. Now, there's going to be two business cycle models we're going to learn. We're going to learn them relatively quickly. Um, we're going to learn this model, which is going to sort of set up a general equilibrium for us. And then uh, we're going to expand upon that general equilibrium by moving into the new Keynesian model. Um, but it's we're going to go through them pretty quickly. So... The two models we're covering are the real business cycle and the New Keynesian models. <clears throat> both of these are the result of the Lucas critique, and both of them are microfounded dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. The RBC model came first, so think of it as like you gotta crawl before you walk sort of thing. Um, it took a lot of modeling used in like microeconomics and expanded it for like a macro model. And it assumes that the sources of shocks that affect a business cycle come from real factors, hence the name the real business cycle model. And it does deliver some interesting results. Some of them can be verified with empirical methods. Some of them are not verified by empirical methods. Um, but we're going to begin with talking about some assumptions and like some stylized facts about the model. And then we're going to get into graphing the equilibrium under this model. And from there, we're going to, once we have everything graphed, we can kind of look at like, you know, supply and demand shock type things and see what would actually affect the business cycle and what wouldn't affect the business cycle under this model. So this was the first big DSGE model. It's sometimes also referred to as like a neoclassical business cycle model because it derives a lot of its assumptions and results from the classical school of economic thought. It's more free market. It favors um, uninhibited production and trade, and there's no role for government to use any sort of stabilization policy in terms of the business cycle. So what are some of the assumptions? Well, first, households maximize utility. So they do the best they can with what they got. Firms do the same thing, hence they're maximizing profit. All firms and households are identical. There are sufficiently many households and firms. So there's there's a lot of them, or at least there's enough of them such that one household or one firm can't affect the market equilibrium. Now, all input markets are competitive. So labor and capital and the output markets, the finished final good, all of them are competitive, perfectly competitive. Now, the model exhibits monetary neutrality. We've all learned about that one, borderline ad nauseum at this point. Next, prices are perfectly flexible, which is an extension of monetary neutrality. The economy enters a recession as a result of real shocks. Now, real shocks can affect the economy. It can put it into a recession. It can pull us out of a recession. But it's, we'll see later on it's not the only source of shocks as suggested by the data. Next, the model would satisfy both welfare theorems of economics, so it suggests that the equilibrium is efficient regardless of whether or not the economy is in a recession. As such, if we have an efficient equilibrium regardless of the state of the economy, there's no role for the government to use any stabilization policy. As such, there's also no rule for the monetary or no role for the monetary authority to have any stabilization policy on their side either. So these assumptions are really like what the classical school of thought ran with. <clears throat> now, where previous models didn't have optimizing individuals for like macro, this model took these classical assumptions and put a micro foundation setup to it. Now, from here, we can see how an individual wants to plan to spend their resources, and then we can just further aggregate that upward to the entire economy, should we want to. And this way... You can see how the economy as a whole responds, but treating each aggregate variable as a sum of optimizing individual agents. Now, there are, I've talked about the three principles of economics in the past. 
the three principles I get satisfied here, optimization, equilibrium, and empirics. Everybody optimizes. Simultaneously, there's an equilibrium that's reached. And then we can use empirical analysis to analyze both the optimization, but more importantly, the equilibrium. And that's going to tell us really how the model works. Now, this model is going to tell us that households smooth their consumption. So they're going to borrow while income is low and save while income is high to maintain a relatively constant and stable level of consumption over time. Investment's a function of capital and interest rates, and government spending is considered to be exogenous in this model. So any changes in government spending will also be offset by equal and opposite changes in consumption or investment. Now, the government gets its revenue either through taxation or by issuing bonds, borrowing money. If the government issues bonds, they're borrowing money from the private sector. But because the government doesn't produce, whatever they borrow out of the private sector are now fewer resources available for the private sector to expand their own businesses. Now, <clears throat> I do want to make it clear, this isn't a libertarian rant. The government literally doesn't make stuff. So whatever they borrow today does have to be paid back with higher taxes tomorrow. Next, households have rational expectations. So they know governments who borrow today are going to have to pay it back tomorrow by taxing households. So they're going to alter their consumption accordingly. Sounds kind of like Ricardian equivalence, doesn't it? Well, that's because it is Ricardian equivalence. So the timing of how and when the government finances its purchases isn't going to matter because it gets internalized in the household's decision making and they're already prepared for it before it even happens. So when the government borrows, it's removing the ability of funds that can be used for private market endeavors. The government borrows money. Well, there's less money for the private sector to borrow. Thus, interest rates will go up. And when interest rates rise, the private sector can invest a lot less. And we're going to get less growth. This is something that's known as the crowding out effect. That government spending crowds out private investment. And this means if a government tries to spend money to do something to help the economy, well, they're going to have to be prepared to have that increase be offset by a decrease in investment. Now, for GDP, think of it like this. You got y equals c plus i plus g. If we were to take a total derivative of that, um, we get equation 2. Okay, maybe this is a bit much. Let's think of it this way. Not 100% right, but maybe this is a better way to put it. The change in y equals the change in c plus the change in i plus the change in g, and that will equal 0. So if you want to see how output changes for any change in consumption, investment, or government spending. But the change in output, if there's a change in, say, consumption, you want to consume more. Well, that means that you consume, you invest less, or government spending drops, <clears throat> or some combination of the two. So if you hold output constant, meaning you don't let y change, if you increase g, i, or if you increase g, or government spending, investment or consumption has to fall by an amount equal to the change in government spending, such that the change in output is zero. So you can allow for things on the demand side, right, the consumption, investment, and government spending stuff, you can allow for that to change. But the change in output as a result of it is equal to zero. So if the government boosts its spending, well, it taxes or borrows, either way, consumption falls or investment falls. So if we assume they have to borrow it, well, what happens is either consumption or investment is going to fall by an amount equal to the change or the increase in government such that the change in output is zero. Now, in likelihood, if they're borrowing, it means investment's going to fall. So you could think of it like the percent change in government spending is equal to the minus percent change in investment. Now, when the government boosts its spending, consumption and investment have to change. And, you know, let's think about how each one's going to move. So agents smooth consumption. So C, consumption, isn't going to move that much, which leaves investment to move around a lot, which sucks because investment is what leads to larger output tomorrow. So if investment gets hit because the government increases its spending, tomorrow's output falls. 
Thus, investment falls because consumption is being smoothed, remember. And because more borrowing increases interest rates, investors don't want to invest because interest rates are really high. And maybe they could be lower tomorrow, so they're going to wait it out a little bit. Okay, so think of it like this, right? Suppose GDP is like $2,500. Consumption is $1,750. Investment is $500. Government spending is $250. So the sum of consumption, investment, and government spending is $2,500. Let's see how crowding out works. So the government wants to borrow $500 to fund a new project. Well, under Ricardian equivalence, if this happens, and we have consumption smoothing, well, consumption is not going to move much, and output today is not going to move at all. So let's say the change in Y is 0 and the change in C is 0. Thus, the change in I equals the change in G, and that's equal to 0. So the change in G is equal to the negative of the change in I. So if government spending increases, investment's got to fall by an equal amount. So if the change in government's $500, so government spending, they increase by $500, then investment falls by $500. Now, if we relax the assumptions that households didn't smooth consumption by a lot, maybe you'd have something like, say, delta C plus delta I plus delta G equals zero. <clears throat> and in this case, well, you get the following by subtracting delta C and delta I from both sides, factor out a negative one, and now we've got the change in government spending is equal to negative one times the sum of the change in consumption and the change in investment. Ultimately, this is a supply side model. So we're assuming that shocks to supply are going to alter the level of output, but any demand side shocks will only affect the composition of output as either consumption or investment and not the level of output. But you still got to learn how all this works. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's think of this whole thing as like a movie, right? For a movie, we need a couple of things. We need like actors who are playing certain characters. We need to know who these characters are, what their motivations are, what their problems are, right? What is driving the character in the particular movie that we're making? That would be optimization. Right? The characters being well-defined, and having motivations and goals that hopefully they achieve by the end of the movie. And if they don't achieve them by the end of the movie, they get a good valuable lesson by the end of the movie. That's fine and dandy. Now we need a plot. We need a way to get the characters from just wanting these things to actually either getting these things or getting a valuable lesson in lieu of them. That plot has these characters interact with each other. And when they're forced to interact, they find there can be some struggle, and they have to find a way to try to overcome that. That would be equilibrium. So think about it like for your favorite movie, right? My favorite movie is Event Horizon. I love that movie. What's your favorite good movie? For me, I don't know, Alien, Casablanca is really good, and Bruges is fantastic, so Seven Psychopaths. Uh, 1984 Ghostbusters, honestly, that's... If you ask me, that's like a perfect movie. Uh, Blade Runner is really good. Tremors is fantastic. That's another, Tremors is another perfect movie, if you ask me. Um, I don't know if you did ask me or not, but I'm just telling you. I'm assuming you asked me. Uh, but here's the thing. What do all these movies have in common? Well, they've got great characters who are played by great actors. So the moral of the story, it's great stories need great characters. Right. If you think of what's an appropriate one here. OK, we'll go with uh, no, I don't want to maybe go with that one. Um, let's go with Casablanca. All right. That's made in like 1943, I think, 42 or 43. Um, production codes are in place, so I can use this example and everything's going to be fine. Maybe the production codes weren't that bad after all, when you think about it. So in Casablanca. There's this guy, he owns a bar in Casablanca, in French Morocco, in Africa. And the bar is, it's a bar, there's like gambling going on. And there, Casablanca is being populated with refugees trying to escape the Nazis in Europe. Probably should say that it takes place in World War II. So the Nazis occupying Europe 
and spreading their influence throughout Europe is causing a lot of people to leave. So they leave and they flee to Casablanca in hopes of eventually being able to get an exit visa to go to the United States. But not everybody can get one. The exit visas are few and far between, so they go and they just kind of wait there. And this one guy who owns this bar, his name's Rick, and he runs a bar named Rick's Bar. And he uh, runs the bar and basically just um, helps get the people in Casablanca drunk and lets them, you know, gamble their money away to sort of pass the time, so to speak. Now, he's generally pretty neutral. He always says he doesn't stick his neck out for anybody. So whenever the Nazis are looking for somebody who did something bad to the Nazis, he won't necessarily just hand them over, but he's not going to protect the person either because, as he says, he sticks his neck out for nobody. And then all of a sudden, long lost love, this woman that he met years before, they fell in love and they spent like, you know, a couple of like weeks together and it was bliss and everything was great. And then she just up and disappears for years. And then she comes back to Rick's bar. And it turns out what happened was she was actually married. She thought her husband had died in a German concentration camp. Turns out he actually escaped the concentration camp. And he's like this resistance leader against the Nazis. And, well, he's really, really in love with her. Loves her. She really loves him, but her husband is kind of... She she needs to be like the muse for her husband. These are really, really great motivations for these characters. These are great characters being played by fantastic actors. Rick is played by Humphrey Bogart, and the love interest, Elsa, is played by Ingrid Bergman. Fantastic actors. So the moral of the story is that great stories need great characters. And the story needs characters before the story can be good. So let's put in some characters. Now, this model is going to be a little different than Casablanca. We're going to have four different actors. We're going to have households, firms, a monetary authority, and the government. Now, the model's going to start with the households. They maximize their utility. This requires calculus, which we won't be using in this course, at least right now. You'll have to take, like, one or two derivatives towards the end of the class. But I'll show you how to do it. Don't worry about it. Now, we've covered consumption a little bit, but there's also leisure, because the household has two different functions, that there are, or two different variables that are looking at consumption and leisure. They like to consume, but they also like to sit on their butt. But the more they sit on their butt, the less they can consume, because if you sit on your butt more, you're working less. That's basically the idea. It's a, what's known as the consumption leisure trade-off. So they're always going to optimize, and there's nothing stopping them from doing that. So any amount that they choose to work is optimal, and it's going to be chosen based on their preferences and the market conditions, namely the real wage rate that's getting paid. When they work, they generate labor, labor income, thus income for the household now is either free to be spent on consumption or investment. <clears throat> and they optimize to get the optimal condition for this labor-leisure trade-off. And they either consume or they save, which is dependent on like their preferences, the interest rate, and the amount they choose to work depends on how much they value not working and how much the wages will be if they work. This gives us the idea of a reserve wage. Any wage below the reserve wage, you don't want to work. Any wage above the reserve wage, you do want to work. So it's like a cutoff value, so to speak. Now, there's some optimization that goes on. And the idea is you want to consume a lot today. You also want to consume a lot tomorrow. The amount you want to consume each day, each period, would technically exceed the amount of income that you have. So there's this balancing act based on your existing income or your budget constraint, but there's also savings. So if you save today, you can consume tomorrow. But when you consume tomorrow, based on what you save today, you get to consume a little bit more because there's an interest rate. So like a penny saved is a penny earned plus interest, so to speak. Now, the household also really likes leisure. They like sitting on their butts. 
they optimize to find out how much they want to work based on the wage rate that's being offered by the firm to them. So they get like a labor supply equation. Households choose to supply their labor based on how much they're being paid to work. So there's another trade-off they face. The more they choose to enjoy leisure, the less income they have to spend. You know what? I'm not even going to spend time on that or this or this. Okay. So here's some interesting finds of the model. First, household smoother consumption. Consumption decisions are made by what the expected future marginal product of capital is. So in a competitive market, the marginal product of capital is going to be equal to the interest rate. So current and future consumption is determined by what households think interest rates are going to be in the future. And if they think they're going to be higher, they're going to save more today to consume more tomorrow. So if there's a high interest rate today, well, you're going to consume a lot less and you're going to save more because you get to consume even more tomorrow. And it also depends on like what their time preferences are. Now, additionally, there's the labor supply stuff. Labor supply is determined every period for only that period. And it's decided based on the current wage rate. If the wage rate today is really high, you're going to want to work more. If the wage rate is really low, you're going to want to work a lot less because it's just not worth it to you. So the choice of labor is determined by current consumption. Because if you want to consume more stuff, you got to work more in order to be able to consume it. Now, firms like to maximize their profits. So there's like inputs of capital in labor. Capital investment is intertemporal. So the firm decides to invest based on their expectations of future interest rates. And they're going to optimize to find the best labor capital combination that allows them to maximize their profits. Don't worry about the production function. Okay. So the firm hires capital at an interest rate R, and they're going to hire labor at a wage rate W. Now, investment evolves according to the law of motion of capital. We've seen this guy before. So the firm gets a couple of equations, like investment demand and labor demand. Investment demand tells the firm how much capital they want to borrow, and labor demand tells them how much labor they want to hire today. I know I'm flying through this stuff really quickly, but that's because you don't need to know how to like look at all the math and interpret all the math and stuff like that. All right. So labor demand tells the firm how much labor they want to hire from households given the wage rate W, or the real wage rate. Now, labor demand is decreasing in the wage rate. I know that's a particularly uh, contentious thing to say these days, but labor demand is decreasing in the real wage rate. So the higher the wage is, or the higher the wage a firm has to pay, the less labor they're going to want to hire. So we get like a labor demand and an investment demand equation. Again, I wouldn't really worry about those too much. Okay, let's get to the monetary authority. There's a central bank, and it regulates the money supply. Now, different banks regulate the money supply in different ways, but in this economy, money is neutral. So it doesn't really matter what the central bank does, because whatever policy they set, the outcome's going to be the same. There's no real effects of changes to the money supply and output or employment. Thus, the monetary authority essentially takes a passive role, and they accommodate the agent's changes in the demand for real money balances. Essentially, what they do is they just set the money supply equal to money demand. Now, government spending is also assumed to be exogenous. So they just take a lump sum tax, if you remember Ricardian equivalents, and that allows them to conduct their spending. So if they borrow more, well, they crowd out investment. So if they borrow or tax, households either way are going to be ready for it, and they're going to alter their consumption accordingly. Now, if the government's balancing their budget, their spending G equals the taxes T, or as we saw in the previous couple lectures, tau. Now, if government spending equals taxes, then you have what's known as a balanced budget. Wouldn't that be nice? So here we don't really need to worry about taxes, and instead we can just sort of look at government spending. Now, I wouldn't worry about how I got these, but this is what you need to know. You're going to have labor markets. For labor markets, there's labor supply, labor demand. For output, there's a production function. 
For the demand side of stuff, we're going to have an IS curve that we play with, which describes the expenditures of the demand side of the economy. So like household spending, investment spending, government spending. We're going to have the LM curve, which is a curve that describes monetary policy. Now, the IS and the LM curve are going to be functions of the real interest rate and output. And the intersection or the equilibrium of the IS and LM curve will trace out aggregate demand. So that's the demand side. The equilibrium of labor supply and labor demand will determine a point on the production function via which the firm produces. If we were to move those points around a little bit, we can trace out aggregate supply. Thus, the intersection of aggregate demand and aggregate supply gives us the like output markets. So we're going to be plotting out all these equations in five different graphical spaces, and they're all going to be interacting with one another. So you change one, you're going to be changing what happens in some of the others, potentially. So this will actually wrap up part one. So ultimately what we did is we just covered some stylized facts about the real business cycle model, and we talked about like the setup, the actors, characters, equilibrium, a little bit. We're going to cover a little bit more about the equilibrium, at least graphically, later and that's what you're really going to be responsible for but i hope this was a nice introduction into the real business cycle model you'll understand it a lot more when you see the graphs which are coming up in a couple of days so thank you for watching and more to come